Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum. Here on the Aerospace Advantage, we speak with leaders in the DoD, industry, and other subject matter experts who explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So if you like learning about aerospace power, you are in the right place. To our regular listeners, welcome back. And if it's your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. As a reminder, if you like what you're hearing today, do us a favor and follow our show. Please give us a like and leave a comment so that we can keep charting the trajectories that matter to you most. Back in December, we visited with some of the key folks who are building America's newest fighter, the F-35. We learned about how one factory in Texas is revolutionizing what it means to produce cutting-edge, fifth-generation combat aircraft at a build rate we haven't seen since the Cold War. And given the threats facing our nation, plus the need to refresh our Air Force fighter inventory, we need to get these planes on the flight line fast. So does the Marine Corps, Navy, and our allies. We're going to circle back on this topic today and talk about the other half of the equation, exploring what happens to the jets after they roll off the factory line and take their first flights. Joining me today is F-35 test pilot Tony Brick-Wilson and J.R. McDonald, Vice President for F-35 Business Development. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here today. Great to be here, Slick. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, looking forward to it, Slick. Thanks. Well, JR, I want to get started with you. Let's dive right in. Can you bring us up to speed on the program? We spoke last to you in December, and there's been some big developments for the program since then. At the top of the list is the first flight for a jet equipped with a new suite of hardware called Technology Refresh 3, or TR3 for short. Our listeners may hear us call it that, which will empower a suite of new capabilities called Block 4. And now this does sound super complex, so help break it down for us and tell us why it matters. When I think about it, I consider TR3 to be the hardware backbone of the upgrades, and I'm mainly talking about a new central processor that will allow the Block 4 enhancements to function, which are largely software-oriented with a few pieces of hardware. Do I have that right, JR? You do. Yeah, think of TR3 as the hardware that enables the software and the capabilities that are in Block 4. Um, but the most important thing to think about is why are we doing this? Why are we upgrading this airplane? It's already the biggest, baddest machine out there. Why is it important to upgrade an F-35? And that's because the threat gets a vote. As, and our desire is to keep it an unfair fight, to stay ahead of the threat in all aspects. And that's what the upgrade is for. And so TR3, as you mentioned, is the hardware upgrade. Think of uh, replacing the central processor in your computer. So it's a new central processor. It's enhanced memory. It's a new panoramic display. And it also allows us the ability to put open system architecture in there. Now, this is all of these things will be critical as we continue to advance even beyond Block 4. Think CCA aircraft or loyal wingman type aircraft and things that we want to do in the future. We want to have that computing power to do that. So that's what TR3 is all about. Block 4 is actually those capabilities that we're going to put in the airplane to be better. And Block 4 are the upgrades. And we believe that this is the most extensive upgrade that's ever happened to a fighter. There are 75, there's actually more than 75 major upgrades going on throughout the platforms. And I say platforms because remember this happens in all three variants. The mission systems are the same in an A, B, and a C. And it's also going to happen for all 17 of the countries that are participating in the program right now. And it's a whole suite of capability enhancements, but if you bucket the kinds of enhancements, think of the first bucket as an interoperability, integrated long-range kill chains, the ability to share information across the network. And then the second bucket I would characterize as increases in the organic long-range sensor capability. So the fact that F-35 is stealthy allows us to get deep into enemy territory, and then it has the best sensors in the world to pick up that information, and Block 4 will increase that sensor capability. And then the last bucket I think of as enhanced capability and enhanced capacity of weapons that the airplane can carry. So it, it's a very big deal and a major upgrade to the capability of the airplane. Yeah, it sounds incredible, JR. I appreciate you breaking that down. Obviously, great capabilities are being added. 
but when will they be available off the line? If you're just now testing them, what's the lag before we see them fielded for operational jets? We actually pulled uh, several of the Block 4 capabilities forward in front of what we call TR3. Think of Auto GCAS, for instance, the automatic ground collision avoidance system so that the airplane can recover itself if it finds itself in an unusual attitude headed towards the ground or something. The services and all the operators realized that was a huge and important capability. So we brought that forward in 2019. We also brought some of the weapons capabilities forward, things like JSAO and GBU-12 and GBU-49. So those capabilities are already starting to show up in the field. And it's all part of the continuous capability development and delivery system, the sort of the spiral upgrade process that we're going through. And the TR3 plan is to have all of those hardware insertions as part of lot 15, um, which should deliver this year. So it's happening real time. And then block four, the interesting thing about block four is that initially there were about 60 capabilities in block four back in the 2019 timeframe. And since 2019, there's been more and more capabilities at that. So I can't tell you when block four ends. But I will say that starting in lot 17, 18, you'll see more and more of those Block 4 capabilities. And the timeline on that, a Block 17 airplane will deliver in 2025. TR3, Block 15, delivers this year. Wow, it's pretty incredible. One question here, will the services upgrade their older jets that predate TR3 and Block 4? So that'll be a service by service and, in fact, a country by country decision. They have the ability to upgrade aircraft as far back as they want to. And depending on how far back you go, it'll be a much more extensive upgrade process if you brought something from, say, a Lot 5 configuration than if you brought a newer airplane, say, a Lot 13 or a Lot 14 airplane. That would be a much quicker modification. Um, Most of those modifications would be in the field with contract field teams. And again, the length of time to do the upgrade would depend on how far back and how old the airplane is that you're trying to upgrade. Copy all. Thanks for that breakdown. Brooke, really excited to get you into this conversation here because the last time we spoke to your team, we wrapped up the conversation talking about the jets rolling out of the factory, and now it's time to launch them to the sky. So take us through the process. What are the steps required to assess whether or not a jet is safe to fly. I mean, as a pilot, I think it's got to be a pretty robust pre-flight that you're going to do. When the the aircraft rolls out of the factory, there's still multiple checks that have to happen before it's turned over to what we call flight ops, where me and my team will take it flying. After it rolls out of the factory, it goes over to final finishes where it gets the paint job and ready to go. And then we send it to a facility to make sure that it meets all specifications from a radar cross-section perspective. It needs to get tested to make sure that it's going to meet the needs of the warfighters that are going to take these aircraft into harm's way. From there, it goes through a series of checks before my team even gets to jump into the aircraft and take them flying. Multiple engine runs, we put fuel and electricity on the jet for the first time. If you really think about it from the time these jets start getting built to the time that my team and I are ready to hop into the aircraft, thousands of people have had a part in constructing these fantastic machines. So there's a tremendous amount of trust and my team and I, we interact with all the production folks to really build that trust because at the end of the day, it's a matter of safety and quality make sure that we're ready to take them flying. I just got to think, okay, now we've got a new F-35 that's been cleared to fly. What is that first flight like? What's involved with the process? So when we take it flying for the first time, every jet gets at least two flights. The B model, the stowable version, gets an additional flight. But on all three variants, the A, the B, and the C, all three of them, the first flight is focused on what we call airworthiness. We're checking out the engines, the hydraulic systems, the electric systems. The very first thing that we do when we take off is we climb about 15,000 foot overhead the airfield and we do some engine checks to make sure that the engine's not, not going to quit on us. We've never had one quit yet, don't anticipate any problems, but it's still, that's the very first check that we do. After that, we'll take it up to high altitude regime and we'll do the same thing. We're checking the engine and its robustness. 
after that, the rest of that first flight has really focused on, like I was saying, the airworthiness, what we call the vehicle systems. Does the landing gear come up and down? Do all the doors cycle like they're supposed to? Is it safe? Is it to have the highest quality build? Subsequent flights after that, we're focusing on the mission systems. We're making sure that each of the sensors are operating like they're supposed to, that sensor fusion is working its magic, and that this aircraft is going to live up to the reputation that Lockheed Martin stands for. And then once my team is done with it, we're ready to put our stamp on it that this is the most capable the most survivable, the most connected fighter jet on the face of the planet and ready to go out to the men and women that are going to take it into harm's way. It's incredible what you all do. I mean, taking a brand new airplane, it's just got to be exciting to go out there and do the flight and all of the points that you're looking to validate and assess and just making sure that you, like you said, you're delivering the safest airplane that you can. Is there a difference between testing US F-35 or one for a partner nation? Not at all. There's no difference in the testing that we do. It doesn't matter whether it's a U.S. jet going to the Air Force or to the U.S. Navy or going to England or Australia. We put them through all the same tests to make sure that they're ready to roll at any given time. Got it. JR, I've got to ask you this because I know you're an F-15 pilot. So what's the difference about what you may have experienced picking up a brand new light gray Eagle from St. Louis versus a fifth generation fighter like the F-35. The system sophistication alone have to be totally different and the F-35 just has to be a different flight experience altogether. It it is an incredible experience. And I'll tell you, when people think about the difference between fourth gen and fifth gen, the first thing they tend to think about is the stealth aspect of the airplane. And stealth is an incredible advantage. It makes anything the enemy wants to do to you harder and anything you want to do to the enemy easier. But from a pilot's perspective and from a system perspective, the first thing that will strike you in an F-35 is the incredible amount of situational awareness you have at all times. Um, The sensor fusion, the ability to fuse all of the information from all of the sensors and present it in a tactical, meaningful way in front of you at all times is the big game changer. To the uninitiated, I'll tell people that this really is a Star Wars airplane. Um, I think of having R2-D2 sitting behind me in an F-35 because they're running the sensors, that they're helping tell the sensors where to look, and if one sensor isn't quite getting the information, then Sensor Fusion will direct another sensor to go identify that. And then it puts it, like I said, in front of you in a way that's tactical, tactically meaningful, and you don't care which sensor gave you the information but you have complete confidence that what what it's presenting is what's out there. And from a defensive standpoint, it also tells you how your signature is doing against the threats out there. So I I would say it's the complete increase in situational awareness that would be the biggest difference. We've often talked about how what really made a fourth-generation airplane so good was the pilot, right? For you, especially as an Eagle guy, you're listening to every radio call, and in the debrief, you're watching every sweep of the radar to make sure that you optimize your cursor placement or your elevation placement with the radar antenna. And now, like you said, with the sensor fusion, this is just happening automatically and better than any human could do to optimize where the sensors are looking. So that's got to be incredible. But Brick, just from a a flying standpoint, what are your biggest impressions about the new jet? I'll echo what JR was saying. The big Multiplier here is the sensor fusion, the amount of SA, right? So when I was flying both the Legacy Hornet and the Super Hornet, I'm managing the systems. I'm as much a manager or a sensor manager as I am a pilot or a tactician flying and telling the radar where to look, telling the pods where to look, scanning multiple displays and listening to a lot of off-board information and comms coming in, just comms intensive running any sort of intercept. And that's where things start to break down. And with the F-35 and sensor fusion, it's you take off and it's all right there. So what we're seeing is pilots attain tactical levels much sooner in their career. What used to take Navy pilots the 8 to 12 years to get their strike force leads, we're seeing pilots attain it in, in as little as 2 to 4 years. And that's just a testament to the amount of essay that this aircraft can capture and present to the pilot. 
The other part of it is just how easy it is to fly and the robustness of the flight control system. With the advanced approach modes that this aircraft has from a naval perspective, it has made the landing on the boat easy and safe. Or it's always been safe, but safer. So it's a ma- matter of what we call boarding rate and being able to get aboard the boat on your first pass. And with Delta Flight Path and the flight control systems, it's become easy. It is a true game changer. I was just talking to some friends of mine that came back from cruise, and it's if you're not hitting the three wire every time, something's wrong. So from my perspective, the making boat operations, whether it's a B model on the small decks or the C model on the big decks routine and, and allowing pilots to really shift their attention to tactics and then the sensors the advanced data links that gives the that essay to the pilot and allows them to achieve those tactical levels much sooner. JR, we just heard it straight from Brick that Navy pilots can now focus their attention to tactics versus landing. So we don't have to hear all the stories about how hard it is to land on the boat. I kid. I couldn't help the opportunity, Brick. You, you teeth that one up for me. <laughs> uh, I don't believe it. We still make fun of the Air Force guys, though. <laughs> of course, it's absolutely. True. There'd still be an LSO out there, and as soon as he walks in the debris fence so they can find out how well he landed, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Getting back to the serious topic here of the F-35, it really does have a safety record, and Brick, to your point about landing on the ship, it is one of the most dangerous things in aviation to, to land a moving airplane on a ship that's bombing out there in the ocean. But the F-35 program has a great safety record and, you know, taking the hit, it's much better than the F-16 in its early days, but mishaps do happen. And I'm curious just how this feedback loop works. How do lessons learned flow through the F-35 ecosystem that's surrounding this jet? What's the crosstalk process like between units in the field, the services, the joint program office that manages the aircraft, Lockheed Martin, and the other contractors that are involved? Rick, I'll take a stab at it. You're obviously a lot closer to it than I am. But uh, obviously, in aviation, dangerous business mistakes, mishaps do happen. When they do, however, we see that the government takes the lead, and we become support players in any investigation, whether it's the Safety Investigation Board or whatever board which is convened by the government. We, as the OEM, will provide background engineering support. We'll help read anything that they pull off of the incident, and, and we'll provide support. But the actual information exchange is controlled by the government back through partners in FMS countries, et cetera. Brick, do you want to expand on that? Sure, Jair. So from a safety perspective, the sharing of information is always critical, right? Because from the pilot perspective, whether I'm in an A model, a B model, or a C model, they, other than the way they take off and land, they fly identical. And a lot of the systems are are identical. So it's important for that information to to flow back and forth. And JR was saying the JPO does a good job of making sure that the information is shared across all the services, across the partner nations, to make sure that we are operating this aircraft as safely as possible. I think the other thing to to focus on here when you talk about information going back and forth, it's not so in addition to safety information, it's the interoperability and the tactics, right? First of all, the F-35 is extremely interoperable to the point where the Navy and the Air Force and the Marine Corps, they're all sharing similar tactics and using each other's information to make this a stronger jet and wrapping in all the nations around the world operating this. Yeah, we started off with safety, but I think the big takeaway is the sharing of information, whether it is specific to safety or how to operate this aircraft, but more importantly, how to employ it and employ it together. One of the other major developments that since we last spoke to Lockheed Martin is the fact that you and the U.S. government arrived at a new agreement for the next lots of the F-35. And for the listeners that are tracking, this is lots 15 through 17. And guys, I'm not saying this just because you work for Lockheed Martin, but we were totally amazed at the new price point. Uh, New A models of the jet are going to be, on average, $80 million per plane. And that's factoring all the inflation that we've been through, supply chain issues, and a lot of the enhanced capabilities given TR3 and Block 4. I did the math, and you guys actually kept the price point below the inflation curve. It's pretty incredible. How did you do it? Yeah, it is amazing. We work hard at that. We've taken that seriously for a long time. We've been continuously trying to drive the price down. 
Now we're at a point, though, where we're adding significantly increased capability to the airplane as we move forward. So keeping the price flat while inflation, especially the inflation we've seen over the last couple of years, has been a major objective. And part of the way we do that is the block buy concept of 15 through 17, buying more than 300 airplanes in one contracting action allows us to use that economic order quantity to keep the pricing down. And affordability, I'll be honest with you, is one of the key things that is selling this airplane around the world. Capability is number one, but affordability is a close second in both the cost of the airplane to purchase and the cost of the airplane to operate. If you follow the international world at all, when the Swiss and the Finns decided to purchase this airplane, they showed a direct comparison with this airplane and any other in the world and showed that the price to purchase and the price to sustain it over its life cycle was by far the best alternative. Aggregate demand, economic order quantity, buying lots of airplanes, and a focus on cost with our JPO partner is how we've kept the cost down. One of the other interesting things I want to talk about the F-35 is the amount of testing and training that can be executed in a simulated environment. And I've talked about it once or twice on the podcast. I was an original core pilot where I spent basically a week a month at Lockheed flying the Sims and began writing 3-1 for the F-35. And I can only imagine fast forwarding now to what the capabilities are in the simulated environment. So can you walk us through this? What does it mean when it comes to innovating new technology, developmental testing and operational testing in the sim? Computer power, computer processing power continues to get just get better and better. So when we were doing developmental testing on the F-35, we didn't walk to the jet with a bunch of unknowns, right? All of those maneuvers, all of the expected test results had already been modeled in, in the labs and simulator environments. So that made testing more effective, more efficient, because we already had the answers to the test. So it was go out and just verify that the jet flew and handled like you expected it to. And it just made testing go much quicker, especially when you're talking about flights, what we call flight science testing. So your loads testing, your what we call flutter testing, high alpha. Basically it was, does the jet respond like we expected it to? And we really, you you always get what we call test discoveries, but nothing that was overly surprising where we're like, ooh, we need to stop what we're doing. So from that perspective, it was fantastic. From a training perspective, again, computing power has come so far that the simulators and the handling qualities models that are in the simulator, it makes it just like you're in the aircraft. And I just like majority of the stuff that you do with this aircraft from a mission perspective, you're doing it out at range, right? So the simulators are great for getting the pilots ready to do what they need to do, getting their scan down, learning how to use the systems and employ them. I want to keep talking about simulation because there's this concept called live virtual constructive or LVC for short that will see F-35 training occur in the completely simulated environment, and this will extend to other airframes too, like the B-21. So what's driving this? And JR, if you want to hop in on this, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. I think we're still in the aspirational phase of having true LVC. For the podcast listeners, let's talk about what that means. Live, real people in real systems think of flying around in an airplane out there. Virtual, real people, but flying in simulated environments and simulated systems. And then constructive, Um, simulated people and simulated systems working. Now, when you do LVC, you want all of those to to operate interoperably together at the same time. And that's quite a challenge. I know that at Nellis in the early 2000s, we thought we were going to get there quickly. That has still not completely happened. Um, But it's the complexity of the systems on the airplane, the complexity of the threat that's driving us to a point where we're going to have to do that. It's going to be the only way we can really test the pilot's ability to use the systems against complex threats that we're just not going to see in the real world as we try and simulate those threats. So we're going to get there, and the airplane is designed to to do that. We're already doing distributed mission operations, and we're ready to go there, but the whole system for LVC is not yet in place. Yeah, copy that. It is a huge undertaking, and uh, it's going to be an ecosystem 
that once it works all together, the training capabilities are just going to be absolutely insane. And of course, I mentioned I did get to fly the sim. I never got to fly the airplane, but I just have to be a fan here for a second, Brick. Can you just talk to us about what it's like to fly the actual jet from the pilot's perspective? How does this thing compare to other types of airplanes that you've flown? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing that you notice about F-35 is how easy it is to fly and how stable it is, right? So when I put the velocity vector or the symbology that tells me where the aircraft is going, when I set that, the aircraft is really stable and it stays there. So it makes the aircraft easy to fly. But the other thing, especially coming from F-18s, we talk about the high alpha capability of the F-18 and how what that brings to, to the pilot. But the, the F-35 high alpha capability is just as amazing. And when you couple that with the stability that I was talking about, it, it really gives you a lot of options in the tactical regime. And coming from tactical aviation, all of us know that, hey, what are, what are the strengths of my aircraft and what are the weaknesses? And we try to exploit the weak, weaknesses of our adversary and capitalize on the strengths of ours and deny the strengths of the adversary, right? Well, the F-35, like I already said, has great high alpha, but it also has a decent thrust to weight. So coming from the F-18, it really opens up the toolbox that I have in the BFM arena, so basic fighter maneuvering or dogfighting. So I can either use to go high alpha with an adversary, or I can choose to go to a raid fight with that uh, thrust of weight. And it, like I said, it just it opens up the options for me as a tactical pilot. But the other part of it is with sensors, the sensor fusion, the advanced data links, Normally, you have that tactical problem solved way before you even get to the visual arena, but we still come to the visual arena and dogfight because it's fun, right? Now, I just, I've got so many options because it does handle so well. Yeah, it sounds really fun. I'm now even more jealous <laughs> after asking you that good question. But just for our listeners, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of interest. How did you get to this point in life? It's a very cool job that you have, and it's important for our audience to know that this is a very specialized skill. You know, in the military and in the civilian world, it requires a lot of extra training. Yeah, I had a commanding officer in my first squadron, and he said the four pillars of naval aviation are timing, timing, luck, and timing. Really, it's been about being in the right place at the right time with a little bit of luck. But all kidding aside, to become a test pilot, it's really a matter of bringing the disciplines of engineering and aviation together. I had the, I got my, received my undergrad in mechanical engineering, and then went, went off to fly my first tour flying Legacy Hornets. I was lucky enough to be selected for the Navy TPS co-op programs. I went and to AFIT, Air Force Institute of Technology, earned my master's in aeronautical engineering, and then went to test pilot school. It's a year long course where you learn the basics of the fundamentals of test piloting, the maneuvers, and all the disciplines, and everything that comes with that. At the end of that year, you go out to your first test tour, where I spent a lot of time here in Fort Worth. My first assignment was the F-35. So much like you spent a lot of time in the sims down here, although not doing tactics, working more on control law, development. The Navy is, I think, a little different from the Air Force in that in the Navy, you bounce back and forth between operational tours and test tours. So after my first test tour, I went back to the fleet to fly Super Hornets, which was good to get back into the tactics and understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. And then we turned back to Pax River, where I had the, again, the luck privileged the timing to take the F-35C to the boat for the first time, which was amazing. And it was the culmination of my education, my training, and my experience in the U.S. Navy that allowed me to transition to be continue to be an F-35 test pilot for Lockheed Martin. Man, it, that's super unique. I always want to continue this here because you've seen the F-35 evolve as a uniform member of the Navy and now as a Lockheed Martin test pilot. How do you compare these two vantage points? On one level, the mission's the same, which is to ensure the jet we deliver for those flying it operational, obviously safe. There must be differences between the two jobs. Do you mind just doing a quick compare and contrast? 
No, not at all. So I have the unique opportunity of continuing to uh, to serve the warfighters, and that's one of the things that really attracted me to this position with Lockheed Martin. So from the perspective of doing flight tests for the U.S. Navy and doing flight tests for Lockheed Martin, at the end of the day, for me and for all my pilots, it's about ensuring that we have the best plane for the warfighter to take into harm's way. And more importantly, not only take into harm's way, but to come home safely every time. So that's what my team and I really focus on. I think the biggest difference that I've experienced between the two is being on the Lockheed Martin side, or excuse me, being on the Lockheed Martin side, the amount of influence I have to make sure that we are sending out the best aircraft that we can with the best capabilities and to be involved early on and to see that see it all the way through and to get it to the warfighter. But one of the things that my team and I do is we really try to engage with the men and women who are flying this aircraft so that we can get their feedback and bring it back uh, to Fort Worth. You just said one word that I want to get in on is engagement. Probably in either of your job descriptions for being the test pilot for the F-35 or in charge of business development, being on podcasts is probably, you know, not really in there. So I just appreciate the transparency that, that you all have brought to the program with it being, I just view that from a taxpayer perspective. From each of your perspectives, I just want to ask you, you know, like what are some factors we should watch in the F-35 program over the next year or two? And frankly, how should we be grading your homework? JR, I'd like to get started with you. Yeah, for us, I think it's pretty straightforward in the near term. We have to focus on TR-3. We have to continue the testing. We've done 31 test flights for TR-3 this year, and those will continue to refine and make TR-3 ready to deliver in lot 15 aircraft this year. So that's number one. Number two is bringing those block four capabilities forward as fast as we can. We want F-35 to maintain its advantage as the best aircraft in the world. And then I think number three, if we do that, you'll see continued demand from around the world for F-35 from new customers, as well as current customers coming back for more airplanes. So it should be pretty obvious if we're doing our job. Awesome. All right. And I know that we joked around with our Air Force Navy back and forth there, but I really want to end this podcast on a flying story. Brick, if you don't mind, you were the first person to trap a border carrier with the F-35C. So what was that like? It, that, it was amazing. Uh, we had been working for months on end to prepare for that, that first arrestment. We were executing what's called a carrier, su- carrier suitability and structural survey and what that is where we land the aircraft in some really unusual attitudes high sink rates you know we achieved a a nominal approach as a three degree approach right we were landing the aircraft in in six and six and a half degree approaches to really test out the landing gear and make sure that it was safe to go at the completion of this testing it's november of 2014 we finally go to the USS Nimitz. It was an amazing day. It was one of those days where we're off the coast of Southern California. Visibility was unbelievable as I was coming over, flying over San Diego out to the ship. I could see the ship 20, 30 miles away. It was just unbelievable. So I get out to the ship. I'm getting ready to, to come aboard and in the Navy, we have what's called a Charlie time, and that's that's your landing time. And anyone who's operated around the ship knows that your hook's crossing the ramp at Charlie time. My Charlie time came and went, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and I'm watching the gas start to go down, so I'm wondering what's going on. And what was happening was, as you can imagine, this was a pretty big deal, so getting all of the VIPs from down below up into the tower so they could watch it, that's what was causing the delay. And the whole time, I'm, I got some butterflies in my stomach because the only thing that I care about at this point is just don't screw it up. Every everyone's watching. Everyone in the world's waiting to see how this is gonna pan out. So they finally they calm me down, and the whole time I'm thinking to myself, "Don't screw this up. Don't screw this up." But as soon as I hit the brake, all of the all that fear, all that concern goes aside. All the training and the testing comes comes to the forefront, and it was all business at that point. And the aircraft did exactly 
what it was supposed to do it handled fantastically it came around into what we call the groove which is the final wings level portion of the approach to the carrier it's a 15 to 18 seconds to to touch down and the first thing that that i noticed because i was flying it in what we call apc or auto so the throttles are taking care of themselves and i'm just using the stick to to come aboard again the flight control laws on this thing made it so stable i'm like the ball's not moving and for the listeners that's the meatball or the fresno lens that the aviators use to make sure that they're on glide slope so the, the first thing that came across my mind is wow this thing is as easy to fly in real life as it is in the sim the difference at behind the boat is you've got what's called the burble to worry about and that's the wind flow that comes off the back of the boat and then rooster tails back up but again, it was with all the tools that Lockheed Martin designed on this aircraft, it was just really easy. And the other big difference, he, it comes in and it touches down, catch the, uh, the three wire. Unlike a typical carrier landing in other aircraft I've done, that's somewhat like a controlled crash. It just, it felt like it just rolled onto the boat. It was just so smooth. I walked around with a smile for the next two days. No one could get it off my face. It was just, it was amazing to be a part of that process, to be a part of the team that made that all happen. And just fantastic. Man, I, it, I'm getting goosebumps listening to it because just the sheer pride of bringing America's newest fighter to the U.S. Navy aboard the Nimitz with all of those folks watching, and not only the pressure but once you do pull it off, you got to definitely feel proud of yourself and, and proud of what you're representing for all that. So thanks for sharing that with us. I really appreciate it. Gentlemen, that's all the time we have for today's episode. I can't thank you enough for your time. I really appreciate both of you being here. And I really want to thank you for what you do because our combat airmen depend on what you all do every day producing F-35s for America. So JR and Brick, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Nick. Keep up the good work. No, my pleasure. Thank you. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.